ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Lock and load. It's time for the gun rack with your hosts, Joey and Drew. Hello and welcome to the gun rack, Sedora Desert Institute School of Firearms Technology's official podcast. I'm Josiah Upper. Folks call me Joey, and with me we have one Drew Poplin. Yeah, Drew Poplin. And we are going to be talking a little bit about the Southern Battles of the American Revolution, specifically the Battle of Cowpens. And we're very excited to get into that. I'm excited to be with you guys again. It's been a hot minute, but it is um, very happy to say, and it'll take all of 30 seconds to cover this, but uh, my contract with SDI expired and they renewed it. And I'm around for the rest of the year at minimum. Uh, I think most of you guys already know that I actually am. Uh, I stopped working full time with SDI almost a year ago, and I'm very blessed to be able to stick around and continue to work with SDI on this awesome project and to talk on stuff with you guys and history like we're doing today. Yeah, we're definitely happy to have you back, um, back in the saddle. That's for sure. I'm very excited about this episode today. As I've mentioned the last two episodes, I think. I think we alluded to it two episodes yeah, ago yeah. and I confirmed it last week, but uh we were actually able to go to the battlefield. Uh, yeah, we did some actual legwork on this one. And we do mean leg work because it was hot, humid, and uh it was yeah, aggressively it, South Carolina. Yeah, yeah. Who would think that you know in an open pasture there would not be much shade? Or anything blocking yeah. the harsh sun's rays. Not a uh, lot. Not a lot. And that same weekend, we went to the uh, Carolina Panthers training camp. That was definitely interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, got to vibe with the Panthers players very, very close by. It's pretty surprising, actually. But that was a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, that was a, it was a good weekend. A lot of How, walking. Did you end up with a bad sunburn? I was... I didn't get... It wasn't like bad, but I definitely got a little singed for sure. Yeah. I don't know what was going on, but like I had a, apparently for some reason, the uh, outline, like where my uh, hair starts, mm -hmm. there, there was like a white outline because for some reason the sun decided not to visit those parts of my face nor uh, my eyes. So that was an interesting uh, visual for a couple days there. Yeah, definitely a lot of fun. Uh, we do have some shout outs want to talk about real quick the first one is lonnie anders he commented on episode 159 on podbean and he recommended that we also look up the battles of musgrave mills and blackstock uh maybe talk about those in an episode i'll be Excellent. honest i've actually never heard of either of those battles so i'm very excited to learn about that and uh go down that rabbit hole yeah and then we also have uh, Terry Collins. He commented on Facebook when I posted the uh, episode 159 audiogram. And that was our, I guess, our preview episode for the series. But he said, great episode. Looking forward to this series. Well, Excellent. Terry, well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And we hope after today you keep looking forward to the series. And of course, we're talking about the Battle of Cowpens today. I, I don't know. I feel like it's more accurate to call this the Battle of the Cowpens. I think one thing for me when we went to the battlefield, something that was illuminated for me was the fact that the battle site and the town of Cowpens are about 10 miles away from each other. Definitely put the uh, the wrong thing in the GPS and ended up being significantly behind Drew to get to the actual battle site, which is always fun. Well, I'm just glad you didn't end up going to Kings Mountain. Yeah, that was a legitimate danger at one point in time. But it all turned out okay. And uh, obviously, we both got back home pretty safe. And so, yeah, let's hop into this. Before we start, I uh, want to share our sources for this episode. Our two chief ones are the American Battlefield Trust and the National Park Service, uh, their websites. But we also had plenty of supplemental ones, the Journal of the American Revolution, Particularly, there was an article by one Travis Copeland 
that was very illuminating. And yeah. Emerging Revolutionary War, they have a website, but they also have a good podcast about this battle. Definitely encourage you guys to check that out. Very knowledgeable on the subject. And then also Dr. Paul T. Carter on YouTube and History Gone Wilder have some awesome videos if you would like to learn more. Again, Joey and I, we never present ourselves or claim to be experts on um, really anything. But um, That's true, actually. (laughs) One thing that we can say is that we do put a lot of time and research into getting these episodes up for you, no matter the subject. Well, sometimes, I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> so, sometimes we have to have a uh, guns.com article in there to supplement things. But Every now and then. Yeah. That's fine. We haven't done that in a while. So, yeah. but Did you happen to catch last week's episode, Joey? Not yet. It's on the to-do list. I have been neck deep in... I didn't even get to do my... I'm in a show that's that's starting to ramp up and i was hoping to be off book before a rehearsal started we didn't even get that far Ooh. been a week so glad to be here today but i have not caught the past one well no worries basically what i did was like it was a you know we all enjoy a good listicle episode so um, of course i did five top fives and i would be interested in hearing particular in particular two of them i did was my top five favorite gun rack episodes and Uh-oh. my top five least favorite gun wreck episodes. Oh, geez. Are so, they just the whole ones you're not in? No, no. I actually made it a rule. Like, I was only going to talk about the ones that uh, I've been a part of. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to seek out the few that you've done solo. Uh-huh. Right, these are my least favorites. Oh, that's nice. That's that's not a source of insecurity whatsoever. So that'll be Heck great. yeah, let's go. <laughs> All right. Um yeah, I guess let's get started on the Battle of Calpins. Heck yeah. Uh, in, in this series, we're kind of doing these battles a bit out of order. Technically speaking, if we're trying to do this chronologically, we should be doing Kings Mountain, then Calpins, then Guilford Courthouse. Yeah. Uh, largely, the main reason we're doing Calpins first is because we actually got to go uh, and yeah. see it in person. Yeah. But also, hey, you know, if Christopher Nolan can build almost an entire filmography based on experimenting with storytelling techniques and nonlinear storytelling, then why can't we? Why can't we? How are, how are we not just like him? <laughs> Name a single way. <laughs> I dare you. I dare you to leave a comment and drive up that engagement. Yes. Um, also, in our most recent episode in the series, I neglected to mention an absolute chat of a human being who played a significant role in the Southern campaign. So significant, in fact, that I think he might end up warranting his own episode in this series. And I am, of course, referring to the Swamp Fox himself, Francis Marion. Definitely was kicking myself for that one. Uh, yeah, he's so, he's so pivotal to, uh, I mean, to this battle in particular, but um, also the concept of the film The Patriot, which I'm sure we're going to reference a couple times in here. I, I would imagine it would sneak itself in once or twice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when we last left off in the series, we had just talked about the Battle of Camden. It, just a refresher, the Battle of Camden was a battle in which the British routed the American force, and it basically saw the American uh, or the local militia and Horatio Gates, to quote Monty Python, bravely run away. Bravely uh, run away away. Uh, we mentioned this not necessarily to dunk on Gates, although it is kind of fun, honestly. Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm absolutely here to dunk on Gates. He was a garbage person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, funny enough, in doing more research for this episode, like I was reading up on some of the decisions he made leading up to the Battle of Camden, a little bit more in depth, and just golly, this, yeah. This, this the mystery. only things in this world he cared about were supplanting George Washington and in terms of being in command of the overall Patriot forces and then driving Benedict Arnold to uh, betray his country. So, I yeah. mean, he was good at the latter. He, uh, well, I mean, you can't argue with that. So despite us dunking on Gates, we mention it because the militia running away would play a factor in how the Battle of Calpins played out. also want to make mention, it's hard to track specific numbers when it comes to this war one record keeping in general at that time 
was not necessarily the greatest. Two, no. embellishments happen, legends spring forth, and you know, so sometimes things get reported on and passed down through history, and uh, yeah. it kind of muddies the water a little bit. And three, and this is just purely uh, speculation on my part, but I'd imagine the nature of the militia itself made it difficult to track these numbers as well. But the Battle of Camden comprised nearly 37% of all the Americans that were killed and wounded during military engagements in 1780. Pretty significant stat right there. And so after Camden, the British were overconfident about how easy it would be to take the rest of the southern colonies. And they crucially underestimated the fight that they would receive from folks in the back country. The coastal areas were a little bit easier for them to uh, take over, or at least what comes to mind is like Savannah and Charleston. But the back country, they would see struggles. And we're going to talk about this more in our Battle of Kings Mountain episode. Yeah. But to, suffice to say, after Kings Mountain, Cornwallis was forced to stop his invasion of North Carolina, and he decided to go back to South Carolina. Meanwhile, in response to the Battle of Camden, George Washington got rid of Horatio Gates for obvious reasons and gave Nathaniel Green control of the Southern Continental Army in late 1780. And uh, Joey, you talked a little bit about Nathaniel Green. Um, yeah. Last episode, you know, his experience as a quartermaster. And Green knew that he had his work ahead of him. You know, keep in mind, the Americans lost a ton of soldiers and the British were quickly gaining ground in the South. So when he arrived, uh, I believe it was December of 1780. I think he got appointed in October and, you know, because travel was obviously slower in those times, didn't arrive till December. When he arrived to see, you know, what he was going to be working with, he was met with sickly hunger pained continentals and the jittery, unreliable militia. So the former... Yeah quartermaster got to work in a dispatch to thomas jefferson green said and joey if you want to read this for me that'd be great give me your no man will green. Th- oh here we go here we go okay no man will think himself bound to fight the battles of a state that leaves him to perish for want of covering nor can you inspire a soldier with the sentiment of pride whilst his situation renders him more an object of pity than envy The life of a soldier in its best state is subject to innumerable hardships, but where they are aggravated by a want of provision and clothing, his condition becomes intolerable, nor can men long contend with such complicated difficulties and distress, deaths, desertions, and the hospital must soon swallow up an army under such circumstances, and were it possible for them to maintain such a wretched existence, they could have no spirit to face their enemies and would inevitably disgrace themselves and him who commanded them. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, these letters to the Continental Congress begging for supplies and food would become a very common occurrence for Nathaniel Green. And this correspondence hardly helped as supplies would become increasingly more difficult to obtain. Now, granted, it's not like the American government didn't want to help its people, which admittedly is a sentence that I didn't think I'd ever say. But as we established in the last episode, we were broke at the time. So now we're fully caught up. There you go. Yeah. So knowing that a giant open battle with Cornwallis, who was leading the Southern campaign for the Brits, would be suicide, Green made the unconventional, potentially drastic decision to split his force into two. So what he did, he sent Brigadier General Daniel Morgan and around 300 to 400 men southwest of the Catawba River. And the goal was for Morgan to hopefully try to find some more supplies, to cut off British supply lines in the west, and to hope that Cornwallis himself would end up dividing his own force. This was a gamble because if Cornwallis didn't divide up his force, then the British could easily overwhelm, you know, go to one force and then the other that were split up and just overwhelm them. And if that that happened, then the entire war itself would be in jeopardy. Luckily for Green, Cornwallis ended up taking the bait. I see Morgan was becoming a nuisance to the loyalist outpost out in the West. Cornwallis had already lost his left flank before because of the Battle of Kings Mountain, and he didn't really want like the prospect of that happening again. So that sort of forced Cornwallis's hand. 
And so who did he decide to deal with Daniel Morgan's men? None other than the rap bastard himself, Bannister Tarleton. Sir Tarleton. Stereotypical Hollywood villain, Bannister Tarleton. And he's so good at it. He's so good at that job. Tarleton had just spent the last few months after Camden on a mission of intimidation. Basically, Cornwallis sent him to intimidate the locals, and the goal was to discourage patriots from joining the fight. And, you know, maybe at the same time, encouraging loyalists to join their cause. There was also the matter for Tarleton of dealing with uh, pesky nuisance in the South Carolina swamps. But for Tarleton's sake and for the sake of a future episode, we won't bore you with the details right now. But this order from Cornwallis would give the young upstart Tarleton the opportunity for further glory. So he tells Tarleton to do whatever it takes to defeat Morgan. And um, I'm not sure of what the proper expression is, but obviously Tarleton was happy to oblige this order. So what follows is Tarleton being on a you know, hellacious path, just booking it towards Daniel Morgan's men. So Tarleton and his elite force of men chased Morgan across the Pacolet River in South Carolina. And he moved so quickly that Morgan's men actually ended up having to leave their breakfast behind, uh, which uh, if you've ever woken up. Heartbreaking. Yeah, if you've ever woken up and just needed breakfast and then not be able to get it, that's 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 maybe the worst thing. Uh, so with the worst of winter quickly approaching, Morgan decide to head for the Broad River, and he had the initial hope of being able to have the Broad River separate the two armies uh, for a period of time. However, because of Tarleton's blistering pace, and the fact that the Broad River with the winter rains had become flood swollen, these plans were eventually scrapped. So without much of a choice, Morgan considered his options. Ultimately, he decided to set his army up in a meadow, known to the locals as the Cow Pins. And he sent word for militias to meet his army there. So the Cow Pins, they had a bunch of forage around, so there, that would be food for horses. Apparently, there was free-range cattle that was also roaming the area, so food for the men. So that was one reason it was a good spot. The other reason was because it was a relatively well-known rendezvous point for the local militias because they knew exactly where to go. In fact... It actually served as a resting place for the Overmountain men, who I'm ex- very excited to talk about, for the Overmountain men on their way to the Battle of Kings Mountain. So we're here the night before the battle, and in comes Colonel Andrew Pickens's militia. This is so just to kind of set the scene, the the air was frigid cold because I mean this was in January. You know the soldiers they're tired from having to run. Surely they're still pretty. You know, hungry. Things haven't been necessarily going the greatest in the war effort in general. And, you know, like many times in the American Revolution, you know, these, you hear about all these harsh winters that the soldiers faced. On this night, something was different. By something was different, I mean that Daniel Morgan was built different. So he did be built different. Yeah. So it's at this point, I want to talk a little bit about Daniel Morgan. Daniel Morgan is a bad, bad, bad man, but but like bad in the good sense. Joey, uh, I've highlighted or I've uh, bolded some of these facts. If you could read the bolded portions for me, that'd be great. And this comes drop some knowledge real quick. Hell yeah! Right. This also comes from uh, the uh, from emerging American Revolutionary War. I just wanted to say that's where I got these specific facts from. Yeah. First things first. Daniel Morgan is dummy thick. Stood at six foot, 200 pounds. Oh, and that was something that when we went to Calpins, Joey and I were kind of talking about because they had this like metal marker or whatever, supposed to be a soldier. And we kind of initially joked, like, oh, that's pretty short. And then we were thinking about it and it was like, that may actually be a accurate size for, you know, the height of some of these guys. Most people back in the day were incredibly short like uh hear about napoleon be like you know the napoleon complex you know it's supposed to be about short guys napoleon was if i'm not mistaken he was like average size to like yeah that's my understanding as well 
So when you think about guys like George Washington and Daniel Morgan standing at you know six feet six feet plus, you can understand uh, they were imposing figures. Joey, uh, who'd you say that? Didn't you say something about oh. like? Oh, he was Matumbo height over these Revolutionary War soldiers. The guy who this basketball player wagging his finger in people's faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that's you know one thing one mentioned like just his sheer you know, imposing figure. Yeah, he was a tank. Um, he also ran away from home at the age of 16. And in spite of that, he was made an overseer of a sawmill, which is like a Ron Swanson origin story. He kind of does remind me a little bit of Ron Swanson, honestly. One, running away from home at the age of 16. Like, he's living the dream of every 16-year-old I've ever met. Um and with him being overseer of a sawmill despite his age, it was during this time, like it surely gave him experience communicating with you know, people with his, um, I won't say underlings because that sounds weird, but uh, people that he was working with that were maybe more experienced or older than him, being able to talk and communicate with those guys. And that would serve him well in his future commanding hundreds of men. Heck yeah. Um, so he afterwards, uh, became a teamster hauling Valley produce across the Blue Ridge into Fredericksburg and other towns in the Virginia Piedmont, including carrying some badly needed supplies back to the frontier. That was the Shenandoah Valley back in the 1750s. And, you know, may mention of that because, you know, we've already talked about how scarce supplies were. And we also talked about Nathaniel Green's experience as a quartermaster and this is speculation but i imagine that morgan's experience as a teamster and nathaniel green's as a quartermaster you know would put them on a relatively similar on on the same page mentally about the need for supplies and maybe how best to gather them yeah i think so he was very involved in the french and indian war he started as a teamster with the british army so at some point in time a british officer apparently had took some offense to something that Daniel morgan said and uh, hit him with the flat of his sword and then morgan who was known for being kind of a high head just knocked the officer out with a punch just one punch ran him <laughs> uh, and this earned morgan a court martial and he was sentenced to 500 lashings um, which is well beyond a death sentence. Um, but not only did Morgan remain conscious, he counted the lashes as they went. And apparently he said he only received 499 and I guess was, was ragey ever since. Later in the war, the French and Indian War, that is, he and his men were ambushed by Native Americans and he was the only one to escape although he was shot through the neck and lost some teeth and also part of his jaw. And he would have that scar, as you might imagine, forever. Good news is that, you know, scars are cool. Like, so if anything, they did him a favor. Yeah, I would think so. After that war, he continued on as a teamster, going back to it, gaining the nickname, the old wagoner, which seems kind of rude. <laughs> And would it often be found, yeah, they found a Berryville, which was known for the time as Battle Town, because there was constant brawling at the tavern, which is, it's delightful. Yeah, and like, you hear like brawling at a tavern, and you're thinking like, oh, like some punches were thrown. At the time, brawling was more akin to like a no holds bar cage fight. So like there'd be like bare knuckle punches, choking, eye gouging, not much was off limits. And to the shock of no one, Daniel Morgan was the closest thing they had to a champion there. Heck yeah. uh, and now in my head, I imagine Brock Lesnar playing the role of Daniel Morgan in a movie. Joey, I don't know if you know who Brock Lesnar is. I don't. I'm so I, sorry. As I continue on, or as I pick up here, I want you to Google a picture of Brock Lesnar. Uh, look at the size of this man's shoulders. So while Joey's doing that, yeah, you know, again, we're at the night Good before grief. Yeah. That is a large man. That's you know who also uh, I think is that a sword tattooed on his chest? Yes. Or yeah, like, like a, a dirt. That, 
Yeah. Yeah. Just crazy man. Crazy. That's a big man. man. I also think Tom Hardy could probably play Daniel Morgan. We could forgive that. I don't like Tom Hardy at all, but you, that's okay. You don't like Tom um, Hardy? I don't. Pretty much anyone attached to the Revenant makes me angry on a deep level. I feel like we're going to need to talk about this. Yeah, we can explore that more down the road, yeah. for sure. Anyway, so the night before the Battle of Calpids, Daniel Morgan, who was keenly aware of the nature of the militia, decided to make three brilliant decisions. The first was to spend the night mingling with the militiamen and you know, basically he was acting all buddy buddy with them. You know, so he'd like ask them where they're from, he'd joke with them. And I'm taking some creative liberties, but I imagine it went something like this. Hey, what's up, boys? Hey, hey, okay. hey, listen, listen, I appreciate you dudes coming here to fight. Like it's gonna be awesome. Like, really excited. I think you know, we're gonna kick some British tail. You know, <laughs> listen, really all I need from you guys is like to fire like two maybe three times you know that's it like i mean we're piece of cake afterwards y'all can go home everyone's gonna like be in the streets probably throw a parade for you and uh, oh you know oh, yeah. honey dips are going to be kissing you in the streets probably get more action there than on the battlefield tomorrow you know what i mean boy hey <laughs> hey, hey hey also i hear a lot of smack talk going on right now you carolina boys and you georgia boys so maybe you guys should have like a competition of bravery like between you two that That'd be so sick, man. <laughs> all right. All right. I'll talk to you later. Um, Peace. And also in my head, I imagine him laughing and you know talking something like that. And as soon as he goes back into his tent, like his face just changes. It like his count. It's just gets like incredibly serious. But that did a lot to boost the morale of the militia and, you know, kind of reassured him. Hey, all I need is two to three shots from you guys. Probably, you know, made the militia men feel like, oh, okay. Like, no big deal. All right. Cool. We can do that. Second pivotal thing he did was he was preparing his tactics. So when Tarleton's men arrived the following day, they would be going against Morgan. And he would implement a tactic that would go on to be called defense and death. So essentially what he did, he had three separate lines that were spread out, I believe, like 150 yards from each other. Yeah. So, yeah. So he had this first line up front, and that consisted of sharpshooters. It essentially, it was like two little groups on the side. Those were the Georgia and Carolina boys. And these guys were crack shots. So he had those guys waiting in the front. 150 yards back, he had a second line, and that would be made up of Colonel Pickens's militia. And then another 150 yards back, there was like this small goalie. Calpins, we'll talk about here in a second, but like the layout of it, it is very deceptively hilly, I guess. Like you you walk on it, it's pretty imperceptible. Imper like when you look out in the distance, you're like, oh, okay, there is like a per you know, kind of a steady incline, st you know, a little bit of a hill going on. So in this small gully, he had his third line, and these would be the Continental soldiers themselves. They were led by Lieutenant Colonel John Eager Howard. And, you know, behind them in reserve was the American Cavalry. And the Cavalry was led by second cousin once removed to George Washington. And I'm talking about Lieutenant Colonel William Washington. Remember his name. He's going to come back up here in a little bit. The third brilliant thing that Morgan did was having the battle at Calpins in the first place. As we mentioned about the geography of Calpins itself, but about five to six miles from the battlefield behind them was the Broad River. So basically, he put his army with their backs to this river, knowing that the militia were prone to running away. And so it didn't give a lot of room to run. Yeah. Yeah. So January 17th, 1781, we have finally made it to the day of the battle. Here um, we are at last. Yeah. So... Carlton, again, was going at this incredibly rapid pace, and he did this by playing catch-up. So morning of the battle, he had his men marching to Calpins as early as 2 in the morning, which, while this was great to help them actually catch up, it was obviously incredibly exhausting. And, you know, these guys, they weren't like a bunch of scrubs or anything. 
they would end up being outnumbered out cow pens. But these guys were still a formidable fighting force. These were trained soldiers, um, you know, trained by perhaps the strongest empire in world history. So Tarleton, you know, we've established his character. He's very aggressive. And so what he would do, he would basically put his men in a linear formation and do a full frontal assault. So it's for his main line, if we're going like left to right from the British perspective, you would see the 7th Regiment of Fusiliers, one t- artillery unit armed with a three-pound grasshopper cannon. In the middle, you had the Legion Infantry. Then you had another grasshopper cannon uh, artillery unit, the Light Infantry. And then on the very far right, you had the 17th Light Dragoons. And then behind them would be the Legion Cavalry and the 71st Highlander Division. So yeah, Tarleton, you know, his strategy was always was always very aggressive. Again, he was also arrogant. He was brash. He was impatient. And due to the forge and brush that surrounded the cow pens, some of his units were still catching up. They were still organizing and they were bringing up the rear. Tarleton, seeing the initial line of sharpshooters, decided that waiting was for, um, and I believe these were his words, weenies. Weenies. And so he sent his dragoons to uh, take him out. But you know, and you know, I talked a little bit this about this last time we did how I was a little ashamed of the reputation of the Carolina militia. But to their credit, the boys from Georgia and the Carolinas, they were actually repelled the dragoon attack. In fact, they actually took out a number of officers. So you have this already from the outset, like a little mini victory. Like, okay, this this is a little different from how it's gone before. But Tarleton then ordered his main line to start marching forward. So at this, the that first line of Americans, the uh, Georgia and Carolina boys, they ran back to the second line. So once Tarleton's men were in range of Morgan's second line, they fired one volley and then another. And all the while, Morgan told them to take aim, particularly at the British officers, to cause confusion and to bring down morale. And so after the second volley... The Americans, once again, ran back. They retreated, but they were making their way to the third line that consisted of the Continentals. Uh, And again, that was on Morgan's instruction. So things were still going according to plan. One thing that's not certain, even the sources I use today, they kind of differ on this. It's not clear whether or not this third line, they kind of like opened up gaps for the retreating men to go through or if the retreating men ran behind them. Not fully clear. So, you know, you have the Americans, they're running back. But you have to keep in mind about what Tarleton was seeing. As we made mention about the layout of Calipins. Joe, do you want to talk about that real quick? Yeah. So one of the things they mentioned, and actually one of the things we didn't notice all that much, as a uh, hilly layout that really kind of determined a lot of this. So Morgan decided to capitalize on some topography. Um, uh, I should say topographical knowledge that Tarleton might not have known just out of pocket. And so these continentals are functionally hiding behind an incline. So you have the militia bolting and he can't see the reserve in the back. He might think that there's a, a reserve of militia. He might think this is some sort of smoke screen so that the Continentals can bolt across the nearest river, the name of which I can't remember, the Broad River. There's little reason for Tarleton to have expected what was in front of him to have played the way that it did. For sure. For sure. Uh, yeah, so he was having like I imagine he was having flashbacks because he was at Camden. Uh, he played a significant role at Camden. He's seeing the same story play out here. And after a couple months or like a month or two of you know trying to deal with Swamp Fox and being frustrated by that, he was not going to be repelled here. He was not going to be denied of his victory. And again, like you know, who, it's hard to blame him because you know you can't really see <laughs> you couldn't really see this third line. So he said, "Damn caution." throw it to the wind, glory awaits. 
And so they pressed forward with a strong resolve and they were going to, their goal was to wipe out these traitors. So what he did, he spotted the militia. And so he sent the 17th Light Dragoons to the American left to take out the running militia. The Dragoons, I think there was about 50 of them, most assuredly were shocked when they encountered the militia, but they were also encountered by the American cavalry led by William Washington. But the surprises were not over for the British. As the British mainline advanced to the top of the slope, they would see staring back at them this line of continentals. So volley after volley was traded. You have the fife, you have the drums going, they're yelling at each other. And Joe, I'm going to get you to read this quote by Daniel Morgan. Uh, but yeah. basically, he's encouraging uh, his force. And he says, He says, Form, form, my brave fellows. Old Morgan was never beaten, um, which isn't true. <laughs> but it sounds so cool. My man's hyping himself up in third person. <laughs> Listen, if you don't hype yourself up from the get-go, how can you expect other people to hype you up? I I'm mean, saying, though. I mean, sure, you can say George Washington, Ooh. you know, kind of. Now knowing that they have been led into a trap, Carlton orders the 71st Highlanders to attack the Americans' right flank. Uh, the Highlanders, as you expect, were rugged and brave, tough, you know, very, very, very strong fighting force. And so this is probably the most confusing point in the whole battle. And uh, it results in nearly a disaster for the Americans. So I'm explaining this the best way I understand it. I've heard it go a couple different ways as well. But you know, this is my best attempt at explaining what happened. So seeing the 71st Highlanders on their right, John eager Howard gave out an order to refuse the line. Refusing the line, basically what was supposed to happen was that the American right flank would bend to kind of meet the attackers. In retrospect, I don't know if the word refuse is a great terminology, especially in the heat of battle, but like this combined with the, the bagpipes and the fifes and the yelling back and forth, obviously it was a little difficult to hear what the exact orders are. And so the men on the right flank thought the order was to retreat. So with them retreating, that's kind of started to create a little bit of a ripple effect. And the line of cont uh, you know, the Continentals started to calmly retreat as well. So Morgan, seeing this, was very confused. He ended up writing to Howard and he was like, basically like, hey, what's going on? And Howard responded something to the effect of what do you mean do you have you ever seen men retreat in such an orderly fashion so meanwhile to tarleton who was on the other side who i believe was on the american's left flank this was another sign to him that that victory was his so the 71st they were still marching towards the fleeing soldiers leaving the american right flank now exposed so Glory was within Tarleton's grasp. He gives the order to fix bayonets. And in the heat of battle, the British decide to break their ranks to pursue, uh, to pursue the fleeing Americans. Now, what the British didn't know was that as the Americans were retreating, they were also reloading. They were doing the two simultaneously. Still, Morgan knew that he needed to try to corral them in. So he rode out to the right flank. And he met them and essentially he tells them, guys, one good volley and victory is ours. And so he gives the order to halt about face. And then once the British were maybe 30 feet from him, he gives the order to fire. And just like that, everything in the battle shifted. That single volley absolutely devastated the 71st Highlanders. Moments later, Howard give his own order for the Americans to make a bayonet charge of their own. So seeing this rush of, you know, these Patriots coming at you with bayonets, uh, about 50% of the British soldiers surrendered immediately. Most of those who didn't immediately surrender fled. 
there were a few that stayed to fight and that didn't go well for them. But meanwhile, on the American left flank, Washington's cavalry re-entered the main fray. So you have this giant rush of soldiers now coming from the American left and right flanks. And what ends up happening is it's a very rare thing to see in battle, especially at the time, but they double enveloped the British. So Tarleton, you know, watching this in horror, you know, summoned dragoons and, you know, implored them to join the fray. Them seeing the way the battle was going, uh, decided, nah, I'm good. They declined and promptly fled with the other soldiers that were now fleeing. And now Tarleton himself would have another issue coming up at him with breakneck speed. And it was a member of America's first family freedom, none other than William Washington. And what happened there ended up being a um, short, albeit intense, fight between Washington and Tarleton. Reportedly, Washington said something to the effect of, where's the boasting Tarleton now? So they fought each other. And uh, the fight ended when Tarleton shot Washington's horse and fled with what little force he had remaining. Another cool story, it's, I chalk it up to legend at this point, but apparently during Washington and Tarleton's fight, there was a British officer who attempted to kill Washington, which, come on, man. Like, clearly, these two guys are having this epic sword fight between each other. There's this cool gravitas to it. And then you're trying to come in like a third wheel. Like, come on, that that's lame. It's really lame of you. So he tried to come in and take out Washington, but apparently Washington was saved by a young bugler, uh, most likely one of his slaves, who grabbed a gun and shot the officer, saving Washington's life. Another thing I wanted to share was... Um, <laughs> and I didn't know this. I didn't see this in any of the research I did until we went to the battlefield. But as we are walking along the trail, you know, they have like the little markers of information and stuff. Uh, and we saw one and it says near the end of the battle, as the Americans swept forward, two continental officers sought to capture the enemy's light three pounder grasshopper cannons. Captain Anderson of Maryland won the race when he used his spontoon to vault forward onto one of the grasshoppers. Captain Kirkwood of Delaware captured the other one. Like, yo, this man is thinking it's the Olympics out here. Um, and there's even a little picture. So it's just, you know, at this point, the Americans were just trying to flex on the British as hard as they can. And I can't think of a more random but kind of cool moment in any of the battles that we're probably going to be talking about. But if it comes up, I'll be sure to let you know. So that was it. The battle lasted around 30 to 45 minutes in total. Like, honestly, this episode talking about the Battle of Calpins is probably going to be longer than the actual battle itself, which is crazy to think about. But at the end of it, the British losses were significant. Going into the battle, they purportedly had a force of 1,150 soldiers. At the end of the battle, there would be 110 British soldiers dead, over 200 wounded, and 500 captured. The Americans, on the other hand, they only had about 12 that were killed and 60 that were wounded. And for Daniel Morgan, obviously, this victory was huge. Trying to capitalize on the advantage that the battle had afforded them, they quickly made their way back into North Carolina across the Broad River. They tried to go as quickly as they could, but you know they also had 50, 50 British soldiers that they were dragging with them as prisoners of war. So they ended up dropping them off, and he met back up with Nathan Nathaniel Green. But the war was still going on, and the battles had to continue. And so it came time to talk about what their strategy was now. And the two would actually disagree on which direction to go from there. Nathaniel Green, he wanted to continue north into Virginia towards like the Dane River in hopes of gathering more supplies. Meanwhile, Morgan wanted to go uh, west toward the mountains where it was going to probably be more secure. So they went back and forth on this. And obviously, Green ended up winning the argument. Apparently, he gently reminded Daniel Morgan of who the commanding officer was. Soon after, 
uh, Daniel Morgan actually would retire from service, not because necessarily the disagreements he had with Nathaniel Green, but because his health was declining. He had, and this is according to the National Park Service, apparently he was dealing with rheumatism and he kept having these reoccurring bouts of malaria fever. So he went home, rested up. He obviously did his job and he did it very, very well. And the impact of Daniel Morgan's win at Calpins and the tactics he used during the battle, Nathaniel Green took note of that. In fact, he would employ similar tactics himself soon after. But of course, that is a episode for a later date. For the British, the loss at Calpins was shocking, obviously. Tarleton himself would be reprimanded by Cornwallis because he essentially blew it. In fact, Cornwallis was so upset with Bannister Tarleton that apparently he took Bannister's sword and he leaned on it. You know, like he put it in the wood and he leaned on it until the sword broke, which in terms of 18th century slides, I would imagine that would rank pretty highly up there. And um, you know, for Cornwallis, he was just sick of South Carolina. We've already talked about what the uh, what South Carolina was like during this period of time, essentially embroiled in a civil war within a revolution. So it was getting too much for Cornwallis. He want, you know, I need to get out of here. So Cornwallis decided he's going to turn his attention north, North Carolina, and meet Nathaniel Green, and they would meet each other at, at a little battle called the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. And that's you know a little teaser for either the next episode in the series or the one after that. But yeah, so that was the Battle of Calpins. Thank you guys so much for listening. I know there was a lot of talk about context, but you know, at this point, you guys know me. You know how I do these history episodes. If <laughs> I told Joey before we started recording, if I didn't do two or three pages worth of context before talking about the actual battle, then I would not be able to sleep at night because I think it's those things that really per- put perspective into decisions that were made. It gives you a better comprehensive understanding of why things happened in the battle the way they did. At least that's my philosophy. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Joey had to bounce. Um, unfortunately, uh, work was calling him. We don't understand that. So I guess I will take us out. To all the gun rack mafia out there, have fun, stay safe, and we will see you at the range. Sonoran Desert Institute is an online school accredited by the DEAC. It is headquartered at 1555 West University Drive in Tempe, Arizona. For more information about how you can craft your firearms future, visit sdi.edu.